It was one of the greatest naval battles the world had ever witnessed and had significant impact on the destinies of the participants. From June the 4th through the 7th, 1942, 150 ships converged upon a small atoll in the mid-Pacific, resulting in a conflagration that saw seven ships slip beneath the waves and the loss of 3,364 men. Before the battle, the United States was on the ropes, reeling from losses at Pearl Harbor, Wake, Corregidor, and Coral Sea, while Japan was celebrating almost certain victory. Afterwards, everything was changed. The Battle of Midway began to take shape immediately following Pearl Harbor. The Pacific Fleet was wary of a repeat attack. As disastrous as December the 7th was, it had not come close to being as bad as it could have been. Although the Japanese had hit the battleships, two fleet carriers and their supporting cruisers and destroyers were at sea. All were spared. Additionally, the submarine base was left untouched, and perhaps most surprisingly, Japan had not destroyed the petroleum tank farm, which lay in plain sight. Replacing the oil stored there would have taken two years, forcing the Navy back to the West Coast, leaving open the Central and Western Pacific to Japanese domination. Still, the Commander-in-Chief of Japan's combined fleet, Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, intended to fight to win. He needed to keep the American Navy off balance, so he decided to capture the Midway, Johnston, and Palmyra Islands, establishing air and naval bases from which Japan could attack and subsequently occupy Hawaii. He would then draw out the Americans to meet his combined fleet in a decisive Japanese victory. In this way, he hoped the war could be ended quickly before the vast American industrial base could be retooled to recreate the ships and aircraft that could, over the long term, defeat Japan. Midway was an atoll, the surface remnant of an ancient volcano. At its highest point it stood but a few feet above sea level. It earned its name due to its position midway between the American continent and northern Asia. By 1942 its two main islands, Sand and Eastern, were well-armed bases for American marines, sailors, and airmen. However, from the American perspective, there was little suggestion that Midway figured as highly in Japan's plans as it did. That would take some additional genius to become clear. Fortunately, such genius resided in a dark basement beneath the administration building at Pearl Harbor. There, Commander Joseph Rochefort and his hypo codebreaking team worked around the clock after Pearl Harbor to understand the thousands of Japanese messages they routinely intercepted. A particular interest was Japan's JN-25 code. Through months of sustained effort, they pierced together key aspects of this cipher, which began to suggest that an operation was being planned against an American base in the Central Pacific. Increasingly convinced the communications pointed towards Midway, they asked Midway to transmit a message in plain language of problems with the island's water distillation plant. Shortly thereafter, Rochefort's team intercepted a message from Japan's high command, stating that the target was short of water. Rochefort carried the news to the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet. Admiral Chester W. Nimitz was known for his raw intellect and almost inexhaustible hunger for hard work. Now Rochefort's team had given the white-haired Texan the tip he needed to turn the tables on the Japanese. But Nimitz knew he could not be the one to lead the fleet at sea. He needed an attack force leader. Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher's performance at Coral Sea had earned Admiral Nimitz's confidence despite the loss of the carrier Lexington and damage to the Yorktown. Normally, the Pacific Fleet's carrier striking force would have been led by Vice Admiral William Halsey, but Halsey had come down with a painful skin condition and was confined to bed. Halsey's task force, comprising the carriers Hornet and Enterprise, would pass on Halsey's express recommendation to Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance. Spruance had commanded Halsey's escorting cruisers from the Marshall Gilbert Raid to the Halsey Doolittle Raid and was surprised when Nimitz informed him that he, a non-aviator, would command the carriers that he had been escorting. 
Fletcher and Spruance were to proceed to a position northeast of Midway designated Point Luck and await further information. Spruance's force sortied first, with Fletcher joining it after Yorktown cleared the yards with hundreds of makeshift repairs to make her seaworthy following Coral Sea. Admiral Yamamoto's force of 100 ships put to sea as well. The Japanese main body sailed directly from Japan to approach Midway from the northwest. Meanwhile, the occupation force steamed from the Marianas. Nimitz also dispatched a collection of land-based bombers and seaplanes to Midway where they joined 25 fleet submarines systematically searching the seas west and northwest of the island. Early on the morning of June the 4th, patrol aircraft operating from Midway reported that, quote, many planes, unquote, were approaching Midway and shortly thereafter located two Japanese carriers and battleships 180 miles northwest of the island. Admiral Spruance quickly ordered his staff to launch everything. Fletcher detached Spruance's task force, but held Yorktown and its aircraft temporarily to protect against another Japanese carrier force possibly lurking in the distance. Spruance had planned to close within 100 miles of the Japanese before launching his planes, but with reports coming in from Midway of Japanese planes overhead, he realized that if he could time the launch of his aircraft perfectly, they could catch the Japanese planes on the decks, rearming and refueling. Calculating rapidly, Spruance launched his 116 aircraft at 0700 at their extreme range, fully acknowledging that many would not make it back. Spruance had hoped for a coordinated attack of dive bombers and torpedo bombers simultaneously hitting the carriers while fighters provided cover overhead, but this was not to be. Japanese Admiral Nagumo received word of the location of the American task force from one of his scout planes and had swung his force to a northeasterly heading as soon as his aircraft were recovered. The Hornets Air Group, with the exception of Torpedo Squadron 8, flew almost due west and never found the enemy. Torpedo 8 Commander, Lieutenant Commander John Waldron, drawing on his tactical intuition, departed the rest of the Hornet Group heading southwest. His instincts proved correct, and at 9.18 a.m., the exact minute the last of the Japanese Midway strike aircraft touched down to rearm and refuel, Waldron's Torpedo 8 drew a bead on the Japanese and began their attack run. History records that every carrier-based aircraft of Torpedo 8 was shot down. Only one pilot survived, and not one torpedo from the squadron hit its target. Still, the squadron's sacrifice was not in vain. Torpedo 8's arrival, followed quickly by the torpedo squadrons from Enterprise and Yorktown, along with a Yorktown dive bomber squadron and a small force of fighters, had a significant impact upon the Japanese task force, dragging down their 50-plane combat air patrol and distracting their anti-aircraft gun crews. Despite their best efforts, the plane's torpedoes failed to detonate. The Japanese fighter cover returned to their ships to rearm and refuel to join their wingmates in a coordinated attack upon the American carrier force. That was precisely when the Japanese force fell into the sights of Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey, commander of the Enterprise Air Group. A half an hour earlier, McCluskey had been mulling over whether to turn back due to low fuel when he spotted a Japanese warship leaving a long wake as it headed northward at high speed. Having a hunch that it was in a hurry to catch up with its carriers, McCluskey turned his dive bombers to match the destroyer's course. A few minutes later, he was over the Japanese carriers. And so it was at 10.22 that SBD Dauntless dive bombers from Enterprise in Yorktown screamed down upon Japanese carriers with aircraft on board, loaded with bombs, and filled with aviation gasoline, just as Spruance had desired. Splitting his two squadrons, McCluskey targeted the carriers Kaga and Akagi, while Lieutenant Commander Max Leslie, who had arrived almost simultaneously with Yorktown's dive bombers, hit the Soryu. Within mere minutes, three Japanese carriers were aflame and taking on water. The aviation gasoline and unstowed ordnance compounded the damage done by the American bombs, and soon the three carriers began to sink. However, due to skillful maneuvering, the carrier Hiryu remained untouched and soon launched its air unit against the Americans. Two waves of Hiryu aircraft, dive bombers, then torpedo planes, found Yorktown in the next hour. Admiral Fletcher soon had to abandon his flagship and transferred full command to Spruance. 
Enterprise aircraft, including Yorktown dive bombers, left homeless by the damage to their ship, would bear down on the lone remaining carrier that afternoon, scoring four or five hits. By the next morning, as the Hiryu slipped beneath the seas, Japan's power in the Pacific was broken, and the tide of war had inexorably began to turn. The Americans also sustained losses. Marine aviation assets based at Midway suffered heavily. A Japanese submarine torpedoed the previously wounded Yorktown on June the 6th, along with the destroyer Hammond. Hammond sank quickly, but Yorktown lingered until the next morning when she too slipped beneath the waves. Midway would be the last battle fought by the regular Navy, the men and ships that had been in service before Pearl Harbor. After Midway, droves of new enlistees and reserve officers would begin to fall into line and man the ships and aircraft spewing forth from the great industrial engine of democracy. Yamamoto had feared this outcome, and he had been correct. Japan, with its population and resources, would never catch up. Perhaps more importantly, the American pilots and seamen who had manned the ships and aircraft at Midway would soon move on, leveraging their experience to lead or train those who would come behind them. Midway cost the Japanese a large percentage of irreplaceable air and maintenance crews, which narrowed her naval campaign and operational options. Ultimately, Japan would never recover its balance before the bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki.